Well, our uh, second reading is the final uh, little section of the, the letter to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians. Uh, it's chapter 6, 10 to the very end, verse 24. It's found on page 1,178. 1,178. Ephesians 6, 10 to 24. Let me pray as we come to God's word. Our Lord God, we pray that we would be strong in the fight, uh, that you would strengthen us, uh, that you would help us to put on the whole armor of God, that we may stand firm. And uh, Lord, as we come to the end of this letter to uh, the church in Ephesus, help us uh, by your spirit uh, to live out deeply uh, the gospel truth uh, on the very front line of our lives. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So Ephesians uh, chapter 6, 10 to 24. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Uh, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So that you also may know how I am and what I'm doing. Atychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I've sent him to you for this very purpose. And that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Okay, you probably didn't know this, but the longest ever recorded boxing match went on for 110 rounds. It happened in 1893. It lasted seven hours and 19 minutes, and it ended in a draw. (coughs) Can you imagine? being in a fight that long and it ending uh, in a draw? Can you imagine being uh, that exhausted, uh, having fought for that long? And the result? Draw. Couldn't decide. But did you know that every Christian is in a far greater fight than the world's longest boxing match of 110 rounds lasting 7 hours and 19 minutes. We are in a lifelong fight. One that doesn't end in a draw. And one of far more significance. Some of us here today may well feel the very deep reality of the Christian life being a battle. Facing terrible temptations. Uh, really struggling with just how is the gospel good news for me in my situation now. And simply living day to day for God's glory and feeling like it's a real struggle, a battle, a fight. 
It's a fight, as we saw in our reading just now. But it's not one that we go into empty-handed. We're looking at the very last bit of this letter to the church in Ephesus. This letter has so far been to encourage and to equip these Christians for their daily life, that they keep going when they feel weak in the fight. Uh, Paul, the author of this letter, he started by uh, reminding them of all the blessings that these Christians have if they are in Christ. Reminding them as well that they were once dead in their sin, but now they are alive in Christ. Yeah. Reminding them uh, that how, of how this affects their relationship with God and with one another as well. Where once there was alienation from God and from one another, now uh, they are family, uh, adopted by God, made one people here on earth. And the second half of the book has been exploring uh, what walking this new walk, this new life really means. What putting off the old self and putting on the new, the radically transformed Christian life looks like in the everyday practical uh, applications of life. We've seen applications so far, haven't we, in the second half of this book for church life, for married life, for family life, for working life. It's sort of at every little front line. And now we get to the individual Christian's life. Uh, these closing verses of Ephesians, they pull together the whole letter. They demonstrate how the armor of chapters 1 to 3 equips us for the battles of chapters 4 to 6. These, let me say that again, these uh, final verses demonstrate how the armor of chapters 1 to 3 equips us for the battles of chapters 4 to to six. So first, let's look at the fight. Let's look at the fight. The first thing to see is that Paul instructs us to be strong and stand against the enemy. Have a look at, at verse 10. Be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand. Verse 13, uh, take up the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand firm. Verse 14, stand therefore. We need to be strong. We need to be strong, but it's not uh, the sort of strength that we'll build by uh, going to the gym. It's not the sort of strength that we'll build by uh, working on it ourselves. Because it's not simply our own strength, is it? Uh, Paul gets it right. This uh, power belongs to God. Have a look at verse 10 again. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. It's his might that we need to be strengthened in. It's uh, probably more accurately, uh, we would say, this verse is saying, uh, go on being strengthened in the Lord and the strength of his might. It's a, an active strengthening of God's power that we receive if we are to be strong in the Lord. Some of us uh, maybe hear talk of a spiritual battle, a, a fight, and being strengthened for it, and we maybe just get quite self-confident, right? Uh, we think we can sort of manage this ourselves. We don't pay that much attention to uh, the armor of the Lord for this fight because, well, we've been uh, well taught, well discipled. The devil is uh, defeated by Christ's death and resurrection on the cross. And so he's retreating and doesn't pose that much of a threat. And so it just doesn't really come up on our radar that much. Yet that's not what Paul says, is it? We're to be strengthened uh, for this fight. Others of us we might find it easier to be sort of more overwhelmed. They're thinking, oh, we have nothing to contribute to this fight. 
Uh, we look around and we kind of see uh, Satan and the devil, the devil lurking behind every corner, every uh, sort of economic and policy decision from a government and the big corporations definitely in the hands of the devil. And uh, we get throwing up our hands and we say, you know, what is the point? That's not what Paul says. And uh, where there are many who in church would never really think about their life as one involved and in a spiritual warfare. And it would just never crop up. It's not what Paul says, is it? And there are churches out there as well that will uh, teach that, that spiritual warfare means that we're to uh, be going out into the world fighting, fighting conquering uh, spiritual battlegrounds, sort of exercising demons wherever we can. Uh, mankind uh, gains in the battlefield of heaven. Again, it's not really what Paul is saying. If we're uh, sort of saying that absolutely everything is spiritual warfare, then the car not starting in the morning is going to be uh, the devil attacking us. It's not what Paul is saying. The reality of Paul's instruction is that we are to be strengthened with God's strength, wearing his armor so that we stand firm. The front line of this fight is the very unimpressive chapters 4 to 6. It's church. It's our marriages, if we're married. It's our families, parents and children. It's our workplaces. Paul says, this is spiritual warfare. So will we stand firm? on these fronts. The spiritual warfare is real. We're involved whether we like it or not. But it might not look how we expect. Will we stand, though, against our very real enemy? And Paul tells us, doesn't he, who we are fighting against. Have a look um, and uh, see what do we need to know about this enemy. In the uh, Art of War, Sun Tzu does, says that famous phrase, uh, know your enemy. A knowledge of your enemy means that you can fight effectively. Paul is really clear who the enemy is in the Christian's life. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Our enemy isn't human beings in the spiritual fight, is it? Uh, our enemy uh, is the demonic. Uh, rulers and authorities doesn't mean a government. It means the spiritual powers of this world, the cosmic powers over this present darkness. The spiritual forces are evil <coughs> in spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's, it's dramatic stuff, isn't it? And Paul is talking about the devil. Verses 10 and 11, the uh, beginning of this section, it's, it's be strong in the Lord, strengthened in his might, uh, put on the whole arm of God that you may stand against the schemes of who? The devil. The world of Paul's first readers would have known this as quite a stark reality. They'd have been familiar with this sort of stuff. Uh, they might have remembered or uh, heard about the Jewish uh, exorcists in Acts 19 in Ephesus who tried to cast out an evil spirit in the name of Jesus without actually knowing Jesus themselves. And so they had to uh, run away naked and bleeding after they'd been overpowered. Or maybe uh, these Christians that Paul is writing to, maybe they were part of the group that had previously been involved in all sorts of sort of pagan practices and, and spiritually dark stuff. And uh, they gathered together and burnt all of their valuable sort of magical uh, books and items in Acts uh, 19, 18 to 20. It caused a m major disruption. And this would have been on these Christians' radar, spiritual warfare. The enemy would have been very, very real. Let's, in our context, though, where we so often think uh, so little about these things, remember that the devil and all supernatural evil is powerful. Even though they are defeated, as we saw back in chapter 1, the, the resurrected and ascended Christ has power over all rule and authority, power and dominion. He is the name above every name. All things are under his feet. He rules over all in the heavenly places. Yet, 
like a retreating army, defeated, but still trying to cause as much damage to every possible infrastructure, and every individual as they retreat. Satan and his demons don't want to concede defeat and will retreat, causing as much damage as possible. They do so with all schemes, verse 11. And verse 16, uh, the flaming darts. These schemes and darts are evil. Our enemy is powerful. Our enemy is also evil. They are the powers over this present darkness, the forces of evil. And verse 13, we need the armor of God so that we can withstand in the evil day. Ruthless, malicious, evil. The devil doesn't take days off. He's described elsewhere prowling like a lion, seeking to devour. The enemy does not rest. The enemy does not uh, rest at all. He will tempt us into sin. He'll subtly seduce us into error, like conniving for us to compromise with evil, cunning beyond compare. While the devil may well attack some with persecution and intimidation, it's just as likely that we experience spiritual warfare through the devil, uh, devil's lies and deceit, as schemes, Paul t- t- calls it. Elsewhere, uh, Satan gets called the father of lies. So when we feel doubts and despair creeping up, thoughts such as, God can't forgive you, you've sinned like that again after all those times that you said you won't do that anymore, or he's so much better than you, she's such a better Christian than you are, Or even, you're good enough. You don't have to try that hard. God just wants you to be happy, just fulfilled, satisfied. So go your own way. It's all lies. It's the the flaming darts of the devil. So what are we going to do against such a war? There is a war on. We need to stand firm, and we do that by putting on the armor of God. We have the best armor, so let's put it on. The armor for the fight, and then how we put it on. The armor, we put it on so that we can stand against the devil's schemes, stand our ground, stand firm. A wobbly Christian, therefore, is something that we don't want to be. A wobbly Christian is one that is not wearing this armor. In this armor, we're to stand on our guard. The first piece, uh, verse 14, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Belts are useful. For a soldier, it would have kept his clothes fastened and uh, he'd be able to march and fight well and it would have carried his sword. For us, it kind of prevents public embarrassment, but uh, useful things. But what is the truth that we are to have fastened around our waist? Uh, Many say that Paul is talking about the truth of the gospel uh, that sets us free from the lies of the devil. Paul has already said that uh, it's it's so powerful in chapters 4 and 21 and 5, 6 and 9. But it could be truth itself as well. Sincerity, integrity. Christians must be uh, honest and truthful. There's an old preacher, uh, William Gurnall, who uh, wrote a massive work on this passage. My edition has like three volumes, um, just on these sort of 14 verses. Um, He says that uh, let's have it as both the truth of the gospel uh, being the foundation for Christians living truthful and honest lives. So leave behind one and you'll leave behind the other. Forsake truth and we'll be uh, hypocrites, liars, deceitful, playing the devil's game, and we will have ultimately forsaken the truth of the gospel. And so we need to be 
honest because we uh, are fastened, fastened with the truth of the gospel around our waist. So think about those various areas of application that we've seen in these previous weeks uh, at church, in our marriages, with our families, in our work. The truth of the gospel uh, fastened around our waist to combat the lies of the devil uh, that we uh, might also walk in truth. The belt of truth. And then having put on the breastplate of righteousness, verse 14. Now this, I think, is the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. Remember, uh, back in chapter 2, Paul explained that we were once all uh, dead in our sin. Our trespasses in sin are living in the passions of our flesh. We don't have any righteousness of our own to trust in. But uh, don't you think it would be one of Satan's greatest tricks in spiritual warfare to uh, point out to us and remind us all of just how sinful we are? Now, you've committed all these terrible sins. Get us thinking, uh, God couldn't possibly love you. Much too bad. All of your history, no way. Make us feel uh, ashamed and not want to open up and let anyone in in case uh, they find out just how bad we, we really are. Now, wouldn't Satan be onto an absolute winner if he could make us feel so ashamed of our sin that we don't want to talk about it? If he could convince us to like, hide a gambling habit or be so ashamed of our adultery that we uh, can't even uh, move from the guilt into repentance? Do we see how if we're armed, though, with the breastplate of Christ's righteousness, it completely protects us from these accusations? Because before the judgment of our holy God, who sees every area of our life, he sees that we are clothed with the perfect, sinless record of Jesus Christ, freely given at such a great cost of death on the cross. So there's no need for us to hide and no need for us to wallow in shame at church, in our marriages, with our families, in our work. Looking to the righteousness of Christ stops us trusting in our own righteousness and stops us from being crushed when we inevitably fail. Stand firm, therefore, against the lies of the devil with the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. Next in our armour, we get as uh, shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. We get that in verse 15. The gospel of peace is uh, really what Paul has been talking about this whole time throughout this book. Uh, the death and resurrection of Christ means that we have peace with God. Uh, we were once alienated, now we're adopted. Sin is forgiven. Relationship is restored. Where once we were hostile to God and his ways, now we have a new life in Christ and peace with God. And a peace with one another as well. You see that the armour of this in previous chapters has been Paul talking about how the dividing wall of hostility between Jewish folk and non-Jewish folk uh, has been broken down by Christ. And in the gospel of peace, God has taken from both and made them a new people in Christ. That's the armour that Paul has been talking about already. Peace with God, peace with one another, and peace with us within ourselves. Hey, elsewhere, in Philippians 4.7, uh, Paul talks about the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guarding your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The gospel provides peace within ourselves, uh, among one another, and peace with God. But what does it look like for us to be wearing these shoes of the gospel of peace? Well, it looks like readiness, ready to stand firm in spiritual battle at church. 
uh, ready to stand firm, in our relationships ready to stand firm, with our families in our work. And knowing the peace of God will mean we are unshakable. Like how uh, good running shoes prevent injury and help you to run on uneven surfaces and mean that you can keep going uh, for longer. I imagine the lies of the devil when it comes to peace. Things like you aren't truly forgiven and right with God. You keep sinning. Or wouldn't the devil love to uh, disrupt church peace? Get us thinking things like, oh, so glad I'm not that sort of Christian. Or, I'll come to church, but I'm not going to get involved. I don't want it to uh, be a relationship with other people. Just me and God, thank you very much. That's not growing church peace, is it? Or, indeed, uh, there's legitimate ways to complain. But wouldn't the devil... Love it to turn us into grumblers about a church or marriages or families and disrupt uh, the peace in doing so. So, how do we combat that? Well, we wear the shoes of the gospel of peace. And then verse 16, in all circumstances... Take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. The shield of faith is totally effective against the evil one. All flaming darts dealt with. Not some, all flaming darts. Some of us may well just immediately be thinking, well, hang on a second. It's the reason why I feel like I'm not standing very firm today. Because my faith isn't strong enough. I don't have a good enough shield of faith. Feels like a lot of these flaming darts are getting through. I'm not quite sure uh, if my faith is good enough. Some of us may have even been uh, taught that in other churches. Uh, Your faith needs to be stronger and the devil won't be able to get you. If you're feeling under attack, it must be because it's your fault. You've let some devils in. You realize none of that is in the passage? The shield of faith is not the the shield of how strong your faith is. And not the shield of your faith being stronger than the devil. No. Remember how Paul has been teaching about faith so far in this letter? What's important is what our faith is in. Not the, the strength of our inner conviction. So Ephesians uh, chapter 2 verse 8, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, but a gift from God. Or uh, Ephesians 3 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Our uh, boldness and access to God based entirely on the object of our faith, Jesus Christ. Think about it, if you were in an actual battle, right? And you were holding a shield and a flaming arrow comes flying to you from the other side of the battlefield. It doesn't really matter uh, how confident you are in in your shield at that moment, does it? What matters? is the effectiveness of the shield. It is faith in Christ that has the ultimate effectiveness. His death on the cross accomplished forgiveness of sins. We could even more accurately sort of translate this, the shield of the faith. It's the gospel faith. True, saving faith, and with it, We can extinguish all the arrows of the evil one. So the temptation comes in whatever form. uh, Tomorrow morning, first thing, look to Christ, the crucified king who gives us his spirit. Shame weighs us down. Look to Christ, 
who endured the shame of the cross that our sins could be forgiven. The shield of the faith, totally effective against the lies of the devil. <coughs> Next, we have the helmet of salvation, verse 17. It's protecting the head, and we need to be armoured with this helmet. Paul, earlier in the letter, he, he prayed that we may have strength to comprehend with all of God's people what is the, the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Ephesians 3, 18 to 19. That knowing and comprehending, there's surely no more impenetrable helmet than that of knowing sure salvation. At the church, in our marriages, with our families, in our workplace, the helmet of salvation, that glorious knowledge that we're to grasp more and more and more, that we are deeply loved by Christ. That protects us against every lie, against every temptation. It's the assurance of the effectiveness of that salvation. And finally, We have the sword of the spirit, verse 17, which is the word of God. Now, the temptation when preaching on uh, a passage like Ephesians 6 is to come armed to the teeth with uh, visual aids, right? Uh, Maybe dress up a a poor unsuspecting staff member in a suit of armor or uh, something like that. It's a very real temptation I resisted. But something that we do all have here on our seats, is a a genuine piece of this armour, the word of God. Did you know that this is the sword of the spirit? And it's effective against the schemes of the devil. Uh, The Bible calls the word of God sharper than a two-edged sword. And you know, in Paul's day, swords would have been common, that that executions and battles and fights, everyone would have known that a sword could be very effective. The word of God, the most effective sword, because it's the sword of the spirit. And it would be good sense, wouldn't it, if you were to wield a sword, that you learn how to use it. You may otherwise end up doing yourselves and others quite a lot of harm, right? So get to know the word of God, the sword of the spirit. Uh, Get deep in it. It is the spirit who teaches us the truth of Jesus as we open up the word. And and so we combat the schemes of the devil um, completely effectively because it comes from his word. You want to learn uh, more about uh, how to uh, handle this sword maybe encourage and help others to do the same, uh, well, why not come to uh, the, the Teaching the Bible course that we're going to be running soon? There are flies about in the service sheet. You'll hear more about it later. Uh, learn how to help others to also wield it more effectively. What then do we do with this armor that we've got? We put it on so that we can stand firm. We have the best armor of the fight, but we need to put it on, verse 11, take it up, verse 13, fasten it on, verse 14, put on, verse 15, put on, uh, verse 15, uh, and, and take up, in verse 16, and uh, verse 17, take, and uh, verse 17, take. How do we actually do this, though? Putting it on. I think Paul has told us already, Ephesians 4, uh, chapter 11, that we're to uh, hear the teaching of the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and that builds us up and equips us for the Lord's work. Uh, He's told us to speak the truth in love with one another. He's told us to address one another in spiritual songs, psalms, and hymns. He's prayed that we'll grow in the knowledge of the truth. Now, putting on the armor of God looks like immersing ourselves in the truth of God. Because the armor of God is the truth of God that Paul has explained in chapters 1 to 3. 
So immersing ourselves and equipping ourselves with the word of God. And after this, Paul draws the letter together by explaining almost as a final weapon in this fight how we live with the armor on. It's prayer, isn't it? How we live standing firm. You might think that he would tell us to put the armor on and then charge. But what he says instead is pray at all times in the spirit. Look at verse 18, with all prayer and supplication. He doesn't tell us to charge. He tells us to pray. Praying in the spirit doesn't mean simply uh, spontaneous prayer, as some Puritans thought, but prayer prompted and guided by God through his word. Uh, Prayer and scripture, therefore, are our two weapons in this armor. And here, Paul moves out of talking sort of about the individual Christian uh, in our our battle of the front line of our uh, church, marriage, family, work. And he, he broadens it out back. He says, keep alert with all perseverance, make supplication for the saints. He's saying, pray for one another. Like a watchman whose job it is to look out for enemy attacks, we are to be praying for one another, that we stand firm against the enemy. Pray for one another. But we also get a prayer request from Paul here, don't we? Uh, That he would have the words to proclaim the gospel, for which he's an ambassador for in chains. He's in prison uh, for proclaiming the gospel, but he's still praying for the opportunity for the gospel to go out and that he'd have the right words in those opportunities. So we too, if we're to live with this armor on, immersed in the truth of the gospel, we need to be praying that the gospel will go out. And for one another to have the words to proclaim it. Paul was an ambassador for the gospel in chains, yet he wanted to declare it himself. What a great prayer to pray for each other today, that we would join in in getting the gospel out in our front lines. Are we praying then for our church family to be doing this? Are we praying for those in our growth group, for the person that we meet during coffee time? This is living with the armor on. Pray for one another to stand against the schemes of the devil. Pray for the gospel to go out. And then something very, very important gets tucked under this heading, final greetings. Is have a look down at the page with me. Uh, Ephesians 6, 21 and 22. That is so that you may also know how I am and what I'm doing. Tychicus, the uh, beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Paul is putting into action part of what's standing firm with the armor of God against a very powerful evil enemy looks like. He's sending a message to other Christians to update them, involve them in his life, ask for prayer and to encourage them. You realize... Every Christian in the room can do that today. I don't want to say that a a WhatsApp prayer request is part of the armor of God, but it is what it looks like to fight with the armor on. It's what living with the armor on looks like. And do we realize that each one of us can encourage other Christians as well, like Tychicus here? When church and faith marriage and children in the workplace. Wouldn't it uh, be amazing if we were encouraging other Christians uh, every time we saw them? Wouldn't it be an absolute win for Satan if he could turn us into discouragers and and stop us praying and uh, convince ourselves that we're uh, too busy to pray for others because we can hardly pray for ourselves? Wouldn't it be a win for Satan if instead of being encouragers, we would be grumblers? And Paul here uh, lives it out with the armor on standing firm, sends Tychicus uh, to let them know how he's doing, update of life, 
and to encourage them. And then he leaves uh, the uh, final uh, section of this uh, letter. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. It's final words of encouragement, peace and grace and love. And that's what we've received in the gospel. And it's what we're armed with as we go out into this world. Well, let's take a moment and reflect on this. And then we'll continue our service in prayer.